Hello, and welcome to First Lutheran Church in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Today's sermon is for Sunday, August 2nd of 2020. This Sunday, Pastor Prangy is preaching on Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 through 43. The sermon theme is, Why Does God Allow Evil? As you listen to the sermon, think about the following question. How does the parable of the weeds explain why God allows evil in the world? Thank you for joining us, and may God bless you as you hear and study the Word of God so that you may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Good morning. Welcome to worship. All across the world, Christians have been reading this morning the account of the weeds among the wheat, Jesus' parable. And we look at that parable ourselves this morning in the context of the Christian harvest. We use the order of service that's printed in your bulletin and projected on the screen. And we begin with the gathering right on the word of God for which you may remain seated. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Jesus, at your word, we are gathered all to hear you. Let our hearts and souls be stirred Now to seek and love and fear you By your teaching sweet and holy Drawn from earth to love you solely Oh, how I meditate on your law how I love your law, I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Knowledge, sense, and sight lie in deepest darkness shrouded till your spirit breaks our night with the beams of truth unclouded. You alone to God can win us. You must work all good within us. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Yet so often we have despised God's word and failed to gladly hear and learn it. For this and all our sins, we bow before God and humbly ask his forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Gracious Savior, good and kind, light from light from God proceeding. Open now our heart and mind, help us by your Spirit's pleading. 
Hear the cry your people raises, hear and bless our prayers and praises. God gave his word so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures testify about Jesus, who lived a perfect life for you, died on the cross to pay for all your sins, and rose again to assure you of your salvation. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. the Son and Holy Ghost, praise to you and adoration. Grant that we, your word, may trust, confident of our salvation. While we here below must wander, till we sing your praises yonder. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the Spirit to think and do what is right, that we who cannot do anything that is good without you may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy Scripture often speaks of Judgment Day in terms of harvest. And so we hear in the, uh, the prophet Joel, chapter 3. Let the nations be roused. Let them advance into the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will be seated to judge all the nations. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vats overflow because the nation's wickedness is so great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened and the stars will stop shining. The Lord will roar from Zion and shout from Jerusalem. The sky and the earth will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel the word of the Lord. In response, we join in singing Psalm 18, printed in the bulletin and projected on the screen. Jacob is our fortress. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The mighty Lord is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You, O oh Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. You save the humble. 
but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. You give me your shield of victory, and your right hand sustains me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The mighty Lord is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The second lesson, two verses from Romans chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we should pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that are not expressed in words. And he who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to God's will. The word of the Lord. We sing the verse of the day in response. Abiding steadfast, firm, and sure, the teachings of the word endure. Bless all who trust this steadfast word, their anchor holds in Christ the Lord. I invite you to stand for the gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13. Glory be to you, O Lord. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants sprouted and produced heads of grain, the weeds also appeared. The servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? He said to them, An enemy did this. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and gather up the weeds? No, he answered, because when you gather up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, first gather up the weeds, bind them in bundles, and burn them, then gather the wheat into my barn. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. We confess the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, Lord Jesus Christ with us abide.
us abide, for round us falls the eventide. Nor let your word, that heavenly light, for us be ever veiled in night. O God, how sins dread works abound, throughout the earth no rest is found. And falsehood spirit wide has spread, and error boldly rears its head. In these last days of sore distress, grant us, dear Lord, true steadfastness, that pure we keep till life is spent, your holy word and sacrament. Lord Jesus, help your church uphold, for we are sluggish, thoughtless, cold. O oh, prosper well your word of grace, and spread its truth in every place. O oh, keep us in your word, we pray, the guile and rage of Satan stay. Oh, may your mercy never cease. Give conquered patience, courage, peace. The cause is yours, the glory too. So hear us, Lord, and keep us true. Your word alone is our defense, the church's glorious confidence. O oh, grant that in your holy word we here may live and die, dear Lord. And when our journey's ending here, receive us into glory there. Dear friends in Christ, why does God allow evil? Why does God allow evil in the world? Listen, this is a good question. It has a background understanding of God that's a true understanding. That is, God is omnipotent. A fancy word for saying he can do whatever. And not in a silly way, can God make a mountain so big he can't lift it. But in an actual way, God can do whatever he wants to do. For you and me, we have things we want to do and we have things we can do, and those are two distinctly different things. But for God, whatever he wants to do, he can do. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, almighty. And knowing that about God makes you ask, why does he allow evil? Why does he allow evil in the world? Because we also know that he's holy, that he's morally perfect, that we understand morality because of who God is. He sets what's right and what's wrong, and he only does what's right. It's impossible for him to do what's wrong. When Isaiah had the vision of heaven in Isaiah chapter 6, the angels were singing, holy, holy, holy. We hear in that, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is holy. The Son is holy. The Holy Spirit has holy in his name. And that holy God, that perfect God, well, we sing it ourselves. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. We understand the holiness of God and the omnipotence of God. They go together. But maybe, maybe God is omnipotent, and maybe God is holy, but he doesn't care about holiness on the earth among human beings. Well, you know that isn't true either. God says to people, all people, be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. That is a high standard of holy. That is absolute perfection. That's what God wants from every human being on the earth. And just in case people are going to negotiate that or purposefully misunderstand that, lower the bar, water it down, God gives us the Ten Commandments and says, keep these, every thought, every word, every action from the beginning of life to the end. Be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. So, with all of that correct understanding of God, why does he allow evil? Why does he allow evil in the world? Because there is evil in the world. You can document that, right? You saw it in nearly every video you watched, article you read, TV show that you ran across. We just sang it in the hymn. Throughout the earth, no rest is found. Falsehood spirit wide has spread. Error boldly rears its head. There is so much evil in the world, you can't even document it. You can take every commandment and show how it's broken out there in the world. You can take every commandment and show how it's broken in our own lives. Our acquaintances, our family, our own personal lives. There is so much evil in the world. Why does God allow it? All right. We admit there's also good in the world. People are doing good things. There are good people. And that's the premise that the disciples came to Jesus with when they said, all right, Jesus, you told that parable of the weeds among the wheat. Explain it to us. Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the people away and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. They weren't understanding it. But they had some idea, it had something to do with evil in the world. And Jesus verified that. He answered them, The ones who sow the good seed, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So that's capitalized S, capitalized M, Son of Man, reference to Jesus himself. God, the second person of the Trinity who became a true human being, Son of Man. He's sowing good seed, like last week's parable. The field is the world. So Jesus is talking about the whole world where he's planting good seed. And the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. So Jesus says, I am sowing good in the world. I am raising up believers in me. I am bringing people to faith in me and then by the Holy Spirit, moving them to do good things. And when those people are doing good things, even if they have mixed motivations, even if there is bad mixed with the good, I declare those things good in the eyes of God the Father who wants holiness. And so Jesus raises up a crop of good deeds being done out there in the world for the right reason, out of love for God and what he has done. So there are good things. There are good seeds bearing fruit out there in the world. And those of us who do good deeds, because we believe in Jesus, even understand this difficult concept to understand that 
two people can do precisely the same thing, but because one of them is a believer, God declares it good, and because one of them is an unbeliever, even though they do the good thing for some good reason that they think up, God does not declare it good because it is not washed clean in the blood of Jesus. It's very striking when you realize Jesus explaining that in Scripture, that all good things come from being connected to him. But it begs the question out there yet, why does God even allow evil things to be done that even look like they're good sometimes? This is the question going on in this parable because there is wheat growing, bearing good fruit, but there are also weeds. And the word Jesus chooses for weeds is a specific kind of weed that looks just like wheat for a time while it's growing. I have some ornamental grass growing in my yard, and I've realized at the beginning of summer, the ornamental grass looks just like the weed growing next to it, and I admit that I've made the mistake of sometimes tearing out the ornamental grass thinking I'm tearing out the weed, and then the ornamental grass keeps growing, and I realize I've really harmed its growth by taking away some of it. This is the weed that's in the parable. The wheat is growing. The weeds are growing, but they look a lot like the wheat. Still, God, who knows everything, could easily solve this. Why does God allow evil in the world? It's really the question that the people in the parable are asking. Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? He said to them, an enemy did this. And then when he explains it to the disciples, he says, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, people on the side of the devil. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. And so the devil makes bad things look good, makes people desire to follow the path of something. Not that it looks terrible, it looks somehow tempting. It looks somehow convincing that it's good. And Jesus says, not connected to me, not good. Some things you can pick out as automatically bad. And other things, all these rationalizations make them good. So, they ask the question, do you want us to go and gather up the weeds? Do you want us to weed out evil in the world? You'd think that the answer would be yes. You'd think that Jesus would say to us Christians, you know the truth, I've made it clear in my word, Proclaim that and weed out the evil. Get rid of the bad stuff in the world and be a force for good. Speak and confess the truth so that evil is weeded out. You'd kind of expect that to be Jesus' answer. Jesus explains that that's not even the question of Christians in the parable. He says, the reapers are angels. The angels who know that God is holy and who know that God is omnipotent are asking, do you want us to go out and gather up the weeds? Hey, we can get rid of this evil for you, God, and we're on the side of good. And Jesus answers, no. Because when you gather up the weeds, you might pull up the wheat along with them. Jesus says that if you spend your life trying to weed out evil in the world, you will quickly harm the sensitive consciences of believers. Because you probably did it this week. When you want to speak against stupidity and error out there in the world, do you see how quickly you go judgmental? And do you realize how that harms sensitive consciences? Because they know about the hypocrisy in your life and theirs. And they know that you do not live the perfect life and you have some odd opinions too, could be criticized in public and in private. We go so quickly to judgmental in this evil world to harm the wheat. And God just says, I'm going to take care of this. I've got it. He says it to the angels. He says it to us. I will take care of this on judgment day. 
All right then. Why doesn't God bring judgment day right now? He is omnipotent. He is holy. He hates the evil. Why not judgment day? And the answer is because he wants to give a time of grace, a time for that wheat to grow and bear fruit. We speak of the time from our conception until our death as the time of grace, a time for God to bring us to faith in Jesus, to let us know about the forgiveness of sins that he's won for us, to let us know that Jesus defeated evil. Jesus won the victory over evil. Jesus won the victory over the devil. The devil thought he had won a victory by tempting Adam and Eve way back in the garden, introducing sin into the world, and by sin, introducing death and pain and anxiety and suffering. And Jesus defeated the devil, crushed his head, by living the perfect life that Adam and Eve did not live, by dying the innocent death to take the punishment for their sin and ours, and by rising to prove that we are forgiven, no strings attached, that our salvation is dependent on him, and that everything we do is declared good because of his work. And then all of those fruits in our lives, love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, the way we show God's love in the world are definitely good, even when we're crabby doing them because of that love of Jesus. And we have that time of grace to develop those fruits, but more important, we have that time of grace to tell our children, our grandchildren, anyone else we can influence, about that love of Jesus, our Savior. Jesus demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. And that's our message during this time of grace. And it helps us to understand why God allows evil. Why does God allow evil? Because he's not just omnipotent and holy, it's because he is also loving. And he wants to give all people a time for repentance and faith in him. But don't be surprised. Judgment day is coming soon. Jesus explains, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will pull out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and those who continue to break the law. The angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, through faith in Jesus Christ, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God that transcends understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold, uphold me with your free spirit. You may be seated for the Wells Connection.
Lord of power and grace, your eyes are on the righteous and your ears are open to their cry. Hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the time of grace that you have given us and the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. Give us an unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will. We ask for your blessing on our individual efforts and on the work of this congregation. In the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our prayer hymn is Your Kingdom, O God. my glorious treasure, my pearl of incomparable worth. Its value exceeds every standard of measure, surpassing the wealth of the earth. Lord, give me your grace and the power of the Spirit to value this treasure aright, that never allured by the world I inherit your kingdom of glory and light. Your kingdom, O God, is alive with the power your word and your spirit bestow. Like yeast they affect the whole measure of flour, enabling your kingdom to grow. Empower me, Lord, as I live your commission, though humble my service may be. And bring every planting to perfect fruition, a mustard seed grown to a tree. Your kingdom, O oh God, is a field for the growing of seeds that your mercy has sown. But still in our midst is the enemy sowing the weeds that imperil your own. Sustain me, O Lord, till your day of returning, and harvest me homeward at last. To shine in the homeland that quiets all yearning, where sorrow and danger are past. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. 
The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We finish with our closing hymn. Come, raise the song of harvest home. All be safely gathered in ere the winter storms begin. God, our Maker, shall provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All the world is God's own field, fruit unto his praise to yield, wheat and weeds to gather sown, unto joy or sorrow grown. First the blade and then the ear, then the full corn shall appear. Lord of harvest, grant that we wholesome grain and pure may be. For the Lord our God will come and shall take his harvest home. From his field shall in that day all offenses purge away. Give his angels charge at last in the fire the weeds to cast, but the fruitful ears to store in his garner evermore. So, Lord, quickly come to your final harvest home. Gather all your people in, free from sorrow, free from sin. There forever purified in your garner to abide. Come with all your angels, come, raise the glorious harvest home. Welcome all of you to worship this morning. A special welcome to guests and visitors. I'm Pastor Prangy, and now I want to know your name, but we have to properly socially distance, so you can sign the guest book that's on the other side of the lit cross there out in the narthex, and then we'll have a proper remembrance of your visit. You could also sign one of these welcome to worship cards that's in the pew in front of you, and then uh, put it in the offering plate by the doors. So this week, turn in your rummage sale items to be sold by Tuesday. And then, if I understand correctly, they get them all arranged on Wednesday. And then Thursday, the rummage sale begins. Thursday, supper time-ish, Friday all day, Saturday morning to early afternoon. And then they uh, do with all the uh, things that are left at the rummage sale the appropriate thing. Running simultaneous with the rummage sale is a silent auction, and the silent auction items are on a table by the principal's office over here. So before worship, after worship, 
at the rummage sale or whichever place, you can look at those silent auction uh, items by the principal's office. Okay, so that takes us through to Saturday. And then Sunday, Monday, the parking lot project begins. And I was told to announce that don't worry about coming to church during the parking lot project. We're going to have valet parking. I have always wanted to be a part of a congregation that had valet parking. I have no idea how this is going to work, but they're setting up valet parking for us so we don't have to worry about parking while the parking lot is being worked on. The parking lot's supposed to be all done before school starts, so that's all worked out. School starting, and Sunday school is starting, but Sunday school, what's it gonna look like this year? Some may be in person, some may be virtual, some may be a, con a combination. If you're willing to play along with figuring out how we're doing in person and virtual Sunday school, and I'm talking about in the teacher role, if you're willing to play along with that, we have a new elder in charge of Sunday school. It's Paul Nalen, N-E-H-L-E-N. If you can't figure out how to contact him, uh, Mr. Davis will help you. And Paul Nalen wants to know, are you willing to help figure out how we'll do Sunday school in this new season? So you'd let him know. I think those were all the announcements. Can you think of any more? I'm good. All right. The Lord be with you in the coming week. Oh, oh, I should say, way to go on the masks. Keep up the good work. Have a great week.